We're at Craig Maggie, so yeah, first time here. See, see what it's like. Yep. Conditions are meant to be really good. Certainly looks good. What's uh, today's objective then, guys? The pumpkin, hopefully. To get back safely to the pub. Yeah, it's the main <laughs> objective. Nice. The main fact about winter, I kind of enjoy about it. I think it's something to do with, it's just a unique atmosphere when you get away into the snow and ice. Um, the isolation and then the sort of working with uh, somebody you trust uh, to get up a route. But it is quite unique compared to sort of try climbing through the summer. It's more risky, you've got a shorter day and there's a lot more energy required. It just takes you to some really amazing places, some really big, some really, you do some really big routes, big multi-pitch routes. Uh, and Recently, the past few years, the conditions have been really, really good and quite reliable, uh, which means you can get out like most weeks. And even some of the shortest walk-ins, you know, it's like a roadside crag. It's not roadside. Yeah, ben Ridley, yeah. Ben and Doe. They say the short walk-ins, but you're walking for one and a half hours, and that's a short, one and a half hour walk-in. Uniqueness of again of Scotland, and uh, I can compare it with going away to Norway. Uh, Scotland, just the shortness of the day, the conditions uh, just make it more challenging. There's a lot of commitment to go out and do a winter route in a day. Generally, I mean, you'd be getting up at like two o'clock in the morning, leaving at three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could be out, yeah, 20, you could be out for 24 hours, longer uh, sometimes. The first thing you said was the early starts, that's what gets me is having to, I'm, I'm really terrible getting up best of times early, but uh, I suppose the excitement of uh, the climb, it means that you don't sleep hours before you have to get up at 2 o'clock, doesn't matter what time you get to bed early. I've still got a really disrupted sleep, so in the back of your head you always think I'm going to be an anchor today. But once you're actually on the mountain, that never enters you. You seem to be full of energy and focus on what you've got to do. We approached um, and rounded the shoulder when we actually saw the face with the pumpkin. Um, we saw it was in ideal conditions and it looked very attractive because of the density of the snow and ice. But also uh, you could quite quickly see um, large mushrooms had formed at the top of uh, pitch one. What presented uh, to us was an exciting uh, steep uh, slightly snow filled, but we could see good steps up through ice, past the mushrooms, and then uh, disappearing around a slight uh, groove. When I'm actually leading, I'm looking around for good placements for axes and also good foot positioning and putting in protection uh, as and when, particularly before reaching a, a difficult or a steep pit. Uh, one of the things I probably don't do enough of, um, maybe for good reason, is look down. Um, I've got a tendency to just keep uh, focusing on the area that I'm climbing on and um, making sure that um, I'm well stabilised within that. Occasionally I have slipped or maybe a foot has uh, come away and um, because you're so focused you know immediately what actions to take. I used to uh, do a lot of rock climbing when I was very young, up until I was about uh, 22 years of age. Then, uh, you know, life and uh, my professional work took over. 
It's just the last five, six years I got back into it. And what was really inspirational was going up to Ben Nevis a couple of winters in a row and getting some superb conditions. But of course, I just walked up and taken some um, easy route up, ledge route or up the tourist track itself. And what sort of inspired me and made me quite emotional was actually seeing the volume of climbers on the white faces of uh, the north face of Ben Nevis um, and popping over the top as they finished off the various lines. Um, I spent a good afternoon uh, talking to them and uh, just uh, seeing what routes they'd actually undertaken. But, uh, but then I saw that uh, I really needed to be back doing the climbing myself. I do like being like in a quite an impressive out there environment yeah. and being on a big multi-pitch route. It's, it's quite it's quite impressive. It's quite an impressive place to be. And when you look around and you, and you can enjoy the exposure in a r relatively safe position, I guess. I think some people think climbers are mad the side of a climb. There's that risk element, and I guess if it was completely safe, then it wouldn't have as much enjoyment factor. But because there's that, those elements of unknown, it, it makes it quite appealing. But it's kind of calculated, you know, you're not putting yourself in a situation that you probably haven't been in before or you know how to control. You know, climbing and these sort of sports build your sort of character. Yeah, I think, um, I think at this particular when I'm young, I always look back uh, when I was a young teenager that uh, uh, going away climbing, even though we didn't actually achieve a lot, we were away for the weekend and it meant we get, didn't get involved with trouble back at home, you know, whether it was gangs or something like that, we always had something to focus on. Um, but as you grow older, I think the risks become maybe a bit more focused. Obviously when you're young, you never really think of the potential uh, damage you could cause yourself with some of the stuff you're doing. But I think that uh, helped to build your strength right through uh, till you become a bit older. But of course the counterbalance is then you become a bit wiser around the damage that you can cause yourself. I mean, I guess it's with any type of climbing, you can just start to deal with things by drawing back to previous experiences. I think as a beginner, if you threw somebody straight into that situation, you can have a heart attack. You can just draw on previous experiences and know that you've got the skills to get yourself out of those particular uh, situations. When I'm actually climbing, I'm totally focused on the moves I'm making. So when an axe pops or you're cramping, uh, comes out of a uh, hold, um, I'm immediately back into focus, um, I don't immediately, my mind doesn't wander off saying that was really risky, I, you know, I'll have to take more care, you're completely in a zone where that um, these things just happen and you immediately take an action to resolve them and move on. Um, I think afterwards that you do get an immediate adrenaline rush and I think uh, even with rock climbing, uh, to get a hold of a good piece of rock or get your feet into a good placement and some good hooks, then you can just suddenly relax, but then immediately you're back into the focus again uh, to continue with the climb. There is the unknown stuff around uh, the loose cornices and loose blocks, uh, the conditions of the ice, and that, that, that's one of the things I'm still trying to read. I've been accustomed to really good ice conditions in Norway, and it's become, when I climb in Scotland in the winter, it's a bit more variable. So there's a lot of things to take into account. I think, you know, that's a good thing with uh, building up that experience and working with somebody who's got that um, knowledge that you can sort of counterbalance that. But there is that unknown quantity of risk all the time. And I suppose maybe that's the thing that uh, drives us to put ourselves in that position. How do you manage it? How do you problem solve it? How do you get out of that situation? Nowadays with the amount of apps and weather forecasts and avalanche forecasts you can actually plan a lot better for the claims but um, once you've got that big experience, you've been in the mountains, there is a bit of Russian roulette and uh, worry about the things that can go wrong but I suppose the counter is good planning and also making the decision uh, to pull out if uh, the situation changes. Um, I, Buzz spoke about cornices and I suppose they're the things that are really unknown. Again, if you're in really good conditions, you can sort of put the risk down to a minimum. But um, I think that's the thing that always strikes me. There's things that are in your control, um, the actual climbing, the gear placements, the protection. But then there's things around uh, ice, uh, being frail, um, avalanches, cornices that are going to drop on you that are going to add to that sort of element of risk. 
you get some instant enjoyment when it's really good weather and uh, you've done a couple of good moves and the other side of things is when you're in extreme conditions and the weather's, the weather's ve very fickle and it's changed and you're damp and cold and wet and it's not really to get back to the car or the pub or back to your accommodation that you realise that uh, you've really enjoyed yourself and that sort of has been uh, spoken about nowadays as type 2 fun. So type 1 fun is the fun that you get immediately uh, as you uh, undertake some sort of sport or you do something really exciting. But a lot of Scottish winter climbers type 2 fun who are actually you've subjected yourself to really extreme conditions and it's not till later on that you actually you know, place of safety they actually think back and say, well, that was fantastic and I'm going to do it again. It doesn't matter what the conditions are, um, whether it's good or bad. When you're on the mountain, you're focused on the, the climb itself. Then all these sort of pressures you've got at home and anxieties at work, then you just really, just really leave it on the mountain.